Good evening and welcome to this AAT Level 2 Synoptic Revision webinar where we will be covering um, the initially the difference between management accounting and financial accounting and how that might look in the workplace and then moving on to the actual um, synoptic assessment and specifically processing bookkeeping transactions which will be coming up in task four. So my name's uh, Claire Glover, I'm a tutor at FI Maidstone in Canterbury. Um, my um, email address is there, so if you've got any questions then feel free to contact me and I will do my best to help. Um, so to start with we're going to do a quick introduction and um, then we'll be looking at the difference between financial and management accounting and how that might look in the workplace. Um, then we'll do a quick look at the task four summary, um, what is you're expected to do in task four um, and the examiner's comments about what is done well and not so well in task four. Then we'll do a quick run through of um, our first intuition mock three task four and our mock four task four um, and finish up with any closing questions. So management accounting versus financial accounting. You will have seen this uh, covered off in some of your studies potentially already. Um, so the key differences are financial accounting are essentially what people think of as our accounts. And what we do is at the end of the period, usually a year, we summarize what's happened. So we are solely looking at that historic information. With our management accounts though, um, we are looking at that financial information, but we're also looking into the future. So a big thing we're doing with management accounting is budgeting and forecasting and thinking what will be the demand. Of course, you will use historic data to help you uh, plan what's going to happen in the future or predict what's going to happen in the future. But it does have that sort of future um, perspective to it. So what does the economy look like? What is the industry we're in? Is it a growth industry? Are we developing new products? That type of thing. So looking into the future. For the financial accounts, we've got lots of rules and regulations. So one of the key things that people or users of the accounts want to know is how is the business performing? If you are a investor or a shareholder in a large listed company, let's say a Tesco's, then you don't have the luxury of calling up the CEO, asking what's going on. One of the only ways you can know what's going on in that company is from those published accounts. So therefore there is lots of rules and regulations um, around what's included in the account, how it has to be presented, um, assumptions that are made. Um, and for those logistic companies, we will then audit them. And some uh, external professional will come in and confirm that those are correct. Management accounting, on the other hand, is internally within the company. So um, less rules. OK, we're going to prepare it how we want it. Um, so less stringent rules and regulations. In fact, no uh, you know, legislation or laws as such covering it. Uh, which segues us into the next point. Um, you are legally required to lay out those financial accounts in a set way. We are uh, we have IIS one, which is governing the layout of those financial accounts, um, so that they are consistent between one company and the next. If I'm trying to decide what you know whether to invest in Sainsbury's or Tesco's, and I look at the accounts of Sainsbury's and Tesco's, they should look similar. I should be able to compare the two. Uh, again, management accounts not used for the same reason and therefore there isn't that set layout. We're going to lay it out how our management want to see it, how the decision users in the business want to see it. I already sort of covered off this next point, which is about the difference between the external users and the internal users. So those financial accounts are prepared for external users, for the current investors, for potential investors, maybe for um, you know, a bank interested in whether they will or won't be lending money to a company. The management accounts, though, as we've been saying, are prepared um, internally for the users, internally for the management. What do we think is going to happen? Should we develop this new product? Should we expand out into that, you know, other geography, for example? And therefore, they are primarily prepared 
for the internal management within your business, the internal users within the business. Um, the financial accounts, though, are purely looking at reporting on what has happened in our business in the last year. So we are using the internal information. We are using our revenue. We are using our costs of sales information to produce those financial accounts. Management accounting, though, as we've said, of course, we are going to look at our internal information, our customer base, our trends, our products, but also some external information, be that industry specific. So electric car market, obviously growing um, or just economy wide. So things not looking so good at the moment necessarily. And therefore, you would use that external information to help you plan for the future. Financial accounts, as we said, lots of rules and regulations around these. They must be prepared annually for the last year, generally the last year. Um, those management accounts, though, as often as you want, often done monthly, maybe potentially quarterly. Uh, for these FMCG, fast moving consumer goods or definitely perishable goods, maybe as often as weekly, we might be preparing these management accounts. For the financial accounts, they are prepared in aggregate. For a whole business, a business as one. We don't have financial accounts for Tesco's Ashford, for example. We have financial accounts for Tesco's PLC, the whole of Tesco's. The management accounts, though, can definitely be broken down into whichever sections we are interested in looking at. So I've used quite a few uh, examples already of a specific product. We want to know information specifically about that product, that product line, potentially about geographies I mentioned, other examples here are divisions or branches, um, so specifically breaking it down. So they're the key differences between the two. Um, now, how might you see that uh, in your job role? So if you are um, in practice working as an accountancy firm, a lot of what you are doing probably is financial accounts, preparing those statutory accounts for companies. They have to be done. Uh, you may, though, get involved in preparing management accounts for specific clients. They're not big enough to have an internal department to do it themselves, and they outsource that to you to prepare some management accounts. Again, quite often monthly, a specific set of information that they want a report from you each month on their performance in certain areas, showing you certain ratios or metrics that they are interested in. Um, if you are in industry or working in a company, again, you may be involved in that department that is preparing the financial accounts, doing the bookkeeping, the day to day logging. But it is potentially much more common that you'll be getting involved in management accounting. So part of the budgeting, part of the variance analysis, which is looking at what was the budget? What do we think was going to happen versus what has actually happened? So um, financial accountant responsibilities, gathering and monitoring financial data. So sales revenues, you know, any liabilities, the balance on your loans, that type of thing. So that kind of more bookkeeping piece around there, logging all the transactions. Uh, definitely those of you who are um, working in accounts are probably or sort of financial accounting probably uh used to preparing monthly or quarterly or maybe these annual statements like we're talking about that balance sheet or statement of financial position and that income statement or statement of profit or loss at the end of each period at uh, potentially the financial accounting could be involved in some of the tax and tax payments so maybe doing the vat returns um that type of thing um, monitoring reporting on accounting discrepancies. So having a look um, since checking your, uh, you know, um, items on your trial balance. Do they look sensible? Have we misallocated something? Um, and then maybe month end or year end processes, um, again, to feed into those uh, annual statements. For the management accountant, a big part of what they might be doing is preparing budgets and helping in the budgeting process, working internally with other departments, um, making those forecasts to assist in. And a big thing, if you've studied anything in management accounting so far, is that planning decision control. So planning what we think is going to happen, using the information we generate to help us make decisions within the business once we're going along, using that control, that variance analysis between what has happened versus what we thought was going to happen. Did we do better than expected? How, why can we roll that out into other areas? Did we do worse than expected? Again, 
why um you know have we overspent on our raw materials should we go and look for different suppliers that type of thing um again feeding us into the next point which is evaluating the evaluating the company's performance using key data and that's going to be around those uh, that variance analysis that that budget what do we think we were going to do versus what we have actually achieved um, and then advising on these problems and suggesting improvements so if you have studied some management accounting drilling down to that variance analysis was it um, an adverse material price variance, for example, that has led us into that? If you don't know what that means just yet, um, then um, uh, you will come on to study that later on within your studies. Um, I'm just admitting somebody. Bear with me a second. So I've just admitted uh, somebody. So welcome. Just running through uh, the difference between management and um financial accounting this is being recorded so if you wanted to listen back to the first bit then um you can catch the recording um moving on then from there that so that's the key differences between that financial and management accounting uh, processes um and the different types of things you might see in a job role in either of those now um Moving on then to the main part of this evening, which is the synoptic revision, specifically looking at bookkeeping transactions and some question practice around bookkeeping transactions. So your exam, two hours long, 100 marks, notional marks per minute, 1.2. That is only notional. So if we have a quick look at um, task four, which is the task we're covering off this evening, um, we have uh content wise it's going to be covering those control accounts so sales edge control account purchase edge control account vat control account and bank reconciliations and we're going to have a look at the sales and purchase edge control accounts in the mock three tasks that we're going to see and we're going to have a look at bank reconciliations in the mock four tasks we're going to see the part of task four that students specifically don't like is that written element so with the written element um we will run through that um and that is one of the areas i think students struggle here in the synoptic assessment so we'll have a look in mock four at a written element um, and how we might want to approach that what does the examiner say about um this task four well he says that and as i said it's just a notional time so notionally speaking it's a 16 mark question task four it would take 20 minutes um and on average students are taking just slightly longer however it does appear to be worth it because three quarters of students are getting to that competency level and again i think part of the reason this is taking students slightly longer is that written element um, what does the examiner see that students do very well here? Well, the numerical parts um, of the double entry is done well. He says that students are strong on the whole on the VAT control accounting and on the bank reconciliations, which is good. Um, area students are maybe not quite so good here, are um, understanding the differences in the control accounts and um, the... Um, uh why those differences arrive um not being able to identify whether entries in those control accounts should be debits or credits so that's sort of that dead click knowledge which is obviously fundamental um in this assessment um not starting or ending an email with the appropriate way based on you know the recipient and the sender and we will have a look at that in uh, the mock three at uh, the mock four task four sorry and also not including a date or a header on the letter so again we'll cover that off and it's all around that professional writing piece um which is really what the examiner is trying to assess here um general comments that the examiner has given is students should practice those written skills and i know that it's not popular and um, you don't want to sit and write and often what i find students doing is in their heads um they will go oh i would write this and i would write that actually writing it out is a different skill altogether thinking what you might write 
and then actually taking the time to sit and write it are two different things. So I would strongly advise that in your revision time, you do stop and um, write your answers out in full to time on a computer. So typing things is different to handwriting. I know obviously a lot of you are used to, to typing, but just make sure that you are dedicating some practice to that. And I know it's not popular, I know it's not fun, but it is vital. Uh, the other thing the examiner says is should focus your revision on your bookkeeping, um, particularly paying close attention to the sales ledger account. Uh, the sales ledger control account um, is the thing that the examiner has expressly mentioned here. Um, right, so what we're going to actually do is have a look now at a task uh, four. We're going to look at our first intuition mock three and our first intuition mock four. Um, so if you've got a copy in front of you, fabulous, but don't worry, I'm going to have it on the screen. I am going to stop the video though so that you don't get a, a sort of super close up of me. So um, perfect. Let's skip to the question right so I'm just going to quickly summarize here um a sales ledger controlled account and a purchase ledger controlled account now of course sales ledger controlled account is um an asset isn't it so it's one of our asset accounts it would be the dead side of dead click therefore um we will assume it would usually have a debit balance so Dead click, of course, is our acronym. Asset, something we own. We own the right to collect in these debts. OK, so therefore we are going to increase the uh, sales edge control account because it's an asset with debits. If we were looking at a click side account, we would be increasing uh, these click items with a credit. So because the sales ledger control account is a dead side item, we will increase with debits and decrease with credits. Now, when we look at the example here, you can see that happening. As we said, we would expect it. We would expect the opening balance to be there on the debit side. Um, we've made more sales. We are owed more money. That is an asset for us. And therefore, we will increase the balance over here on the dead side, the debit side. Um, with the uh, credit side, we can see that, OK, someone has sent something back. They don't expect to have to pay for that. That will reduce what we are owed. Or they've paid for it again that will reduce what they've owed or we've given them the discount again that will reduce what we are owed so over here on the credit side because this is an asset account we can see that we are decreasing uh, the final one there is unfortunately the bad debts if we're not going to receive the money it's not fair it's not accurate for us to show it and therefore we must remove it so just to recap Debits will increase the balance on the sales ledger account, sales ledger controlled account. Credits will decrease the balance. Purchase ledger control account then is almost the opposite, isn't it? This is a liability account, a click side account. And therefore, we will be increasing over here on the credit side and decreasing over here on the debit side. So if we have a look here, we've got um, expecting an opening balance there, a brought down balance on the credit side. We owe, it is a liability. If I buy more goods on credit, then again, that is going to increase what I owe. I increase over here on the credit side. On the flip side, though, if I send something back, I don't expect to pay for it. That will reduce what I owe. Or if I pay for it already, I don't expect to have to pay for it again. And therefore, 
it will be on the debit side. Also, if the employer says that I, if the employer, sorry, if the um, supplier um, that is supplying me says that I um, can have a discount, I don't expect to have to pay that part. And that will also be a debit on the purchase center control account. Now, just quickly re uh, recapping on this written section, and there will be a written section. You may well be asked to prepare a letter or potentially an email. A letter is going to be a more formal mode of communication normally than a note or an email. Um, we will often see these, uh, you know, in the exam being, uh, you know, put onto letterheads. One of the things that we saw the examiner commented was not done very well is the sign off on the letter. And one of these conventions that we need to remember is if we address the letter to just a generic, dear sir, dear madam, um, then we need to sign it off with yours faithfully. However, if you know the name of the person um, that you are writing to, so let's say, dear Mr. Jones, the sign off will be yours sincerely. So remember that rule and try and get it correct because you will score marks for doing that correctly. I'm not going to run through the grammar points here, but it is, of course, um, good to, in your professional writing, uh, you know, write um, clearly, professionally, good spelling, good grammar. If you are worried about any of these things, then feel free to contact me. I'd be more than happy to run through them with you. So starting with mock three, task four, let's have a look at actually how this is done um, in an example. So it is the end of December. Um, we are, uh, you know, uh, partially preparing Crumbles Bakery purchase ledger control account, i.e. this is our liability. We owe our suppliers for the flour or the milk or the eggs or whatever we have purchased. We owe them. Right. So purchase ledger control account. Click side liability account as we said we will because it's click side we'll be increasing over here on the credit side decreasing over here on the debit side we would expect the brought forward balance to be over here on the credit side we owe money right we have paid the other half of the transactions coming out of the bank we have paid some money that is going to reduce what we owe the next piece of information we're told about is that we have now managed to balance off the purchase uh, and the purchase returns day book. And we need to record those down into the purchase edge control account. So we've got the purchase day book extract. These are additional things we have bought. This is going to increase the overall liability. So increase the balance on the purchase ledger control account. Remember, this is the click side of dead click. So to increase, we are going to credit. The debit, therefore, is going to go to purchases expense. However, this business must be a VAT registered business because we can see there's a VAT amount. So the question is, what are we doing with the VAT amount? Well, the VAT amount there is essentially saying I have paid £6,833 in VAT. Going back to our VAT control accounting and our, our VAT or indirect tax studies, we can uh, hopefully recall that actually I will be able to net off that VAT paid from the VAT I have collected. We are almost viewing that, therefore, as an asset, something the tax man owes back to me. So that would be a debit VAT. So remember, the purchase control account is always going to be the gross amount we have to pay, the total amount we have to pay. The purchase's expense is going to be the net amount and the VAT is, of course, going to be the VAT amount. For the purchase returns day back, and the returns are always a bit trickier, but it's essentially the reverse, isn't it? I have sent back 
pounds worth of goods i therefore don't expect to pay for them that is going to reduce the balance on my purchase control account purchase control account liability click side of dead click so therefore to reduce it i need to debit it um the other half of course is going to be credit that purchase returns expense account potentially you could debit credit it straight into the purchases account uh, aat generally speaking will have a returns account set up though so that is going to um, be reducing the purchases expense i've had because i've sent those things back now for the vat what we're saying here is when i bought that item and i record down the liability i was saying actually i can claim the vat bit back from the tax man I'm now saying, actually, I have sent those goods back. Those goods back. I haven't incurred the VAT, and therefore, I'm going to uh, reverse that with a credit. So again, remembering when we're putting things into the purchase ledger control account, the control account is going to show the gross amounts. The return purchase returns account is going to be the net amount, and the VAT account is the VAT amount. So, having talked that through, hopefully the answer to A is not too bad here. So, what will the entries into the purchase ledger control account be? From the purchase day book, what we are saying here is I am increasing the amount on the uh, purchase ledger control account. That is what we have done here. So, we will be crediting. For the purchase returns day book, as we said here, I'm actually decreasing the amount I have to pay because this is a click side item. It's a liability. That will be a debit. To work out the overall balance here, now you have to be careful because we are adding these two entries to the control account that we already had. So what we must do is we are saying, OK, initially we started off owing £16,610. We paid off £30,920. We racked up another £41,000.40p, but we sent 2188 of it back. Now, you could draw that out in a T account if you wanted to, but I know a lot of us would actually quite prefer to see it in just a simple calculation. So the brought forward balance or the current balance at the beginning there was £16,610 owed. We then paid off £30,920. Um, we had new purchases that we saw showing in the purchase day book of £41,000. Pounds 40 piece, we'll add that to the balance. But we had those purchase returns of 2,188 pounds, which we'll be able to deduct. Now, mathematically, if you were to run that down, you would come to 24,572 pounds 40. So, in terms of the amount, 24,572. 40. Is that a debit or a credit? Well, hopefully, as we've been saying, this is an overall liability still. We owe £24,000 still, and therefore it's a credit balance. So hopefully that part of the task wasn't too bad. Now, in our mock three here, we then move on to look at the sales edge control account. So do be careful in the exam because at the moment you're in purchase edge control account mode uh, and we are switching to sales edge control account. Completely the opposite, really, in terms of the double entry. So just make sure you read super carefully. So uh, this is a summary of the transactions. This is a summary of the transactions uh, with customers. So our customers during the month of December. Show whether each entry will be a debit or credit in the sales ledger control account in the general ledger. So as we were saying, this is now an asset to us. We are owed the money. So we will increase 
on the debit side and we would decrease on the credit side. So starting with <clears throat> this balance brought forward at the beginning of the month of December, we are owed £24,900. This is an asset, so therefore a debit. We then sell some more goods on credit, so people owe us the money. This is increasing the asset. So again, a debit. Some of our customers then pay us. Of course, they don't expect to have to pay us twice for the same thing. So once they've paid us, this will reduce the amount of money we can collect in, reduce our asset with a credit. And then we give some of these customers a discount. And now again, that's going to reduce the asset, reduce what we're gonna collect in. Finally, some of our credit customers were either not happy, had overordered, but for whatever reason, they've sent some of those goods back. They do not expect to pay for those goods. We cannot collect that money in, and therefore that will also decrease our asset. So decreasing the asset with a credit. The next part of the question then is asking us, what will the balance brought down on the 1st of January be? So what we need to do is we essentially need to turn this into a, a mathematical sum. I started off being owed £24,900 and then I added to it another 57000 So I was then owed another £57,000. Customers though paid me off £66,000. I'm not owed that anymore. I will knock that off of the balance that I am owed. Same for the discounts I've dished out to my customers and same for the rent. So if you ran that sum down, you get 7,190. Now be careful, of course, because in the exam, you might just spot the 7,190 and instantly tick the first one you see. But he has given us two answers of 7,190. This is the sales ledger control account. It's an asset account and he is asking us for the balance brought down on the first day of the next period where it will be an asset. If he does ask you for the carry down balance on the last day of the period, that would be a credit. So do again, just be very careful here and read very carefully. Hopefully that was okay, but again, you've got my contact details. If you're not happy with any of that, drop me an email. I'd be more than happy to run through it with you. Finally then, this part of the question for us in our mock three isn't actually asking you to write anything. It's just asking you um, about letters and that form of communication and whether things are true or false. So letters can only be used as informal communication. Well, no, that's not the case. In fact, actually, they tend more to be used as formal communication, don't they? You get letters from your bank and your mortgage advisor and things like that. Um, a letter can have numerous recipients. Traditionally, of course, a letter is, you know, a one to one. But I'm sure you have all had junk mail. So even if it's not just a leaflet, you can actually get um, some um, sorry, I'm just omitting someone else here. Um, you can actually get uh, letters being written to you um, that are, um, you know, not actually aimed at you. And that letter has gone to hundreds and hundreds of different people. So circulars, essentially. So no, a letter can have numerous recipients. So for those who just joined, um, if you obviously have missed the beginning, um, this is being recorded so you can catch it up. You can get the link through our uh, website to watch the rerun. And if you've got any questions or anything you've missed, um, please just contact me. I'd be happy to run through it with you. Um, so part E, we are sort of here. Um, letters are used both internally and externally. Well, not really. You don't normally send, you know, a letter to your colleague in the office do you you would either walk over and talk to them or you know send them an email I wouldn't necessarily say um, that letters are both internal and external 
Um, I actually missed one, didn't I? Only very complicated information should be sent in a letter. Um, again, no, not necessarily. Something you formally want to tell someone um, that can go in a letter. It doesn't have to be complicated. So, you know, for example, telling you you have to record a appear in court, very, very serious, but not necessarily very complicated. It would just have the date and, uh, you know, place you had to turn up. So uh, that would be sent by letter. The final one here, um, it is not possible to know if a letter has been received. Well, again, not true. So even though we, we joke and we call post snail mail, it has developed a lot. So if you have the Royal Mail app, for example, and you've sent something by signed for delivery, you will be updated in real time. You can actually see the signature of the person that signed for it. So again, not true there. So hopefully um, that's not too bad and that's okay. Uh, drop me a message in the chat if you've got any questions. Okay, excellent. In which case then, let's move on to mock four, question four. This one did have an element of writing, but before we get to that, the first part of this task in terms of the control account element was around a bank reconciliation. So you can see here, we are being given um, the uh, 29th of May, we have received a bank statement as of the 26th of May. So again, in the real world now, you can actually access your bank information, your bank statements in real time, but this has obviously been posted to us. It's taken a few days to get here. This is the information as at the 26th of May. Um, so we've got the transactions that have been recorded down by the bank here. And then we can see that as at the 26th of May, so the same date, this is what our record of events was, our cash book in the general ledger. What the question is asking us to do is to complete a bank reconciliation, i.e. compare those two records. So at the 26th of May, how much money do we have in our bank account, essentially? Well, according to the bank, we've got 3,115. However, if you were to balance off the cash book at the same date, it would not show you the same amount of money. Um, the main reason for that, it could be error. There could be an error somewhere, but the main reason for that is timing differences. So in terms of our methodology for completing this, we will start, of course, with the bank balance per the bank statement. Now, again, be careful. It is this bottom figure here we are interested in. OK, not the top figure. This was the balance at the 4th of May. We are interested in the balance at the 26th of May. So this final balance here. Now, it could be presented in slightly different ways, but essentially this C means a credit. And again, be super careful. This has been prepared by the bank. For the bank, us having a credit means they owe us the money. For them, it's a liability because they have to give the money to us. They owe us the money. They are holding £3,115 of our money. So it's the reverse of how we see it in our cash book. So that credit means I have £3,115. So that's the first thing to be noting down, £3,115. Right, now, it doesn't necessarily matter which way around, but in our FI materials, the first thing we say to do is look at <laughs> the paid in column or the receipt column in the bank statement. So I should do those in um, this blue colour. And compare that to the paid in part, which for us, of course, is the debit side of our cash book. On the bank statement, this is essentially money in, isn't it? Money coming into us, the receipts into the bank. And on the cash book debit side, cash, of course, is an asset. So I'm going to be increasing it over here on the debit side 
decreasing it over here on the credit side. So let's do that now. So I uh, can see essentially that on the bank statement, I started the period with £4,500 in the account. Tick, that agrees over here. Now do watch for that. If there is a slight difference, then you would need to note that down. But here we can see um, that they match. The next thing we can see is on the 17th of May, by back, so an electronic transfer, we receive £500. And yes, we have that recorded down as well from Mark Limited here. The next thing we can see is that we have uh, 26th of May, some monies have been paid in at the bank, £650. And again, 26th of May, I can see, ah, it was from Jack Limited, £650 have been paid in. So I can tick that off. So I'm happy that I have accounted for all of the items that are shown on the bank. But in the cash book here, I can see I have not accounted for £980 from Bob Limited or £470 from Robinsons Limited. Now, what could that be? If we think about it, I am sat in the office and I'm opening the post. I get a check in. I will record that check down straight away. That's good practice. And I will log that I've received that. By logging it, I will, let's just say, which is probably the case, Bob Limited was a credit customer of mine. So I'm going to debit cash and credit the purchase control account, show that Bob and Robson have paid me for those items. I've got the check there though. I log it and hopefully, again, if I've got, uh, you know, best practice in place, I maybe have wandered down to the bank that very day um, or let's just say within a couple of days, so 24th of May, I've paid those checks in. And you will have to the system. So those checks may well Load. not have, um, you know, uh, cleared instantly, probably won't maybe potentially will if we bank at the same branch of the same bank but more than likely it's going to take a few days so am i wrong on my cash book no i'm not wrong i have had those checks in am i wrong in the bank again no they've done nothing wrong there's just that timing difference and we call those our outstanding lodgements so we're going to add and you wouldn't need to type this in the exam but this is what they are these outstanding lodgements of uh, Bob Limited, £980, and Robson Limited of um, £470. So in total, I'm recognising £1,450 more in my cash book than they currently are in the bank. However, I unfortunately can't log into the bank and just add that money on myself. It'd be chaos if people were allowed to do that. Um, but it's not that it won't, well, we're hoping that it's not that it won't clear. It will come in, so it's just a time and difference. So I'm going to want to add the £1,450 to the current bank balance of £3,115. The next step then, once we've dealt with the um, paid in, for the money inside of the bank statement, I'm going to want to look at the paid out side, the money out. These are, of course, debits on the bank statement, but credits over here on the cash book. So these bits here. So I'm going to do the same exercise. So I can see on the bank statement, I've paid out a check. Uh, for £760, I can see that, yes, that has cleared out and it was for water, okay, my water payment. Mm -hmm. um, I can see that I had incur bank charge of £35 and again, I can see that over here being captured in the cash book. I have a, another check paid, check number 16, £840, which appears to be for electric key and I can see that has been accounted for. Um, and I can see that I've got a standing order to pay my rent of £900. And again, I can see that has come out also from my cash book. I've, I've um, recorded that down in my cash book. However, 
I'm happy now that I have accounted for everything that was on the bank statement. But when I look down and see which ones I've marked off on my cash book, I can see that I have not shown this payment to the telephone company on the 18th of May. That has not come out of the bank. And again, think about the logic here. And those of you who work in offices can probably empathise with what I'm saying. Um, you know, you've got the telephone bill, you know, that the telephone needs to be paid. You go into your, you know, saved zero bookkeeping system and you enter that in. You're saying, yeah, I need to raise a check for this. And you that is the start of the process before the check can be printed. Um, so you go in, you do the double entry and you say credit, cash, debit, telephone expense, for example. So once we've done that, that's when the check gets printed out of the check printer. Um, then we have to get it signed off by maybe one or two managers. Then we can put it in the post. Then it has to arrive at the telephone company. Then they have to bank the check. Then it has to go through the clearing system. So even though 18th of May to the 26th of May seems potentially like quite a long time, it isn't necessarily. OK, um, so therefore, we want to um, look at this as well. And the term we give these is unpresented checks. So we have written the check, but it hasn't been presented at the other end. Presented, sorry, checks. Um, this was the telephone expense of £200. And therefore, we need to subtract that. We know that monies are going to come out. So we will actually be knocking that off of the current balance on the bank of 3,115. So once we've added on that extra 1,450 and deducted the 200 pounds, we will have a balance per the cash book of 4,300 and 65 pounds. So hopefully um, we are happy with that. Any questions on that? Fabulous. Okay, then the final bit, which is obviously the bit people tend not to be quite so happy is, is we're going to be writing this letter. And of course, in the exam, you would be free typing in here. We've highlighted the bits you need to fill in in green. So let's have a look at the information we're given though. So today is the 1st of June X1. First piece of information we're going to want to put in, the date. You would date um, a letter, which is what we're going to have to write. Second, uh, we are preparing letter to Mr. Green. Okay, so a couple of pieces of information we're going to get from that. One, that is who we're going to address the letter to. But secondly, remember at the very beginning of this session, what we talked about with sign-offs, we know we're writing to Mr. Green. Therefore, that sign-off is going to be yours sincerely. If we were writing to Dear Sirs, which if, if they don't tell you who to address the letter to, that's what you're going to have to go for, Dear Sirs, um, then we would use that sign-off of yours faithfully. So we've got a couple of things we can gather from the fact we know we're writing to Mr. Green. One. That's who we're addressing the letter to. And secondly, that sign off is going to be yours sincerely. Um, we told the name of the company, Bob Limited, and the address. So again, that is going to go into our letter. Um, what are we writing to them about? Well, they are one of our customers. And the letter is about an invoice which is overdue for payment by 10 days. We will need to include a statement of account. So again, a couple of things we can remember about or do with that information. One, we will refer to that in the letter. We will say we are attaching a statement of account. And two, if you have an X box to fill in like this, we will be saying, yes, our enclosures, which is what X is short for, um, are going to be that statement of account. Um, and we're going to say the payment needs to be made immediately. The other thing that we've got, um, or we are told in the question, is that the total that they owe is actually £820. So when we refer to the statement of account, we can say, we have included our statement of account showing your outstanding balance of £820. However, only £400 of it is overdue. Um, so 
we're not talking a huge amount of money here. We're not talking a significant amount of money. Um, and also, it's not everything they owe. So they're not massively in arrears. They're only 10 days late. Um, so the tone of this letter, I would say, is going to be polite. We're not getting particularly aggressive at this point with them. They're a customer of ours. Yes, there was some money. Uh, it's 10 days overdue, which is an ideal. Um, but yeah, the tone of the letter at this point isn't going to be super um, aggressive. We're not massively escalating at this point. Um, and we're told exactly what invoice relation to. We need to be specific. Tell someone which one it is. Now, as I've said, at this point, we're not being uh, you know, you know, accusatory or aggressive at this point. Um, we will ask. It appears four hundred pounds is overdue. If there is a reason for this, please let me know. It might be that it never arrived. It might be that they've sent it back. Okay, so it might be that they're sending it back. Ten days isn't a massive amount of time. So if they have returned something to us and it's crossing in the post with our letter. We don't want to be sort of screaming and shouting saying you owe us money if they're returning it. Maybe it's faulty, something like that. Perhaps it's not an actual item, but maybe we'd um they've sent us a check in the post and there's a timing difference, or you know, a big, pretty big discount, but perhaps we've given them a discount of some kind. So at this point, we're going to pose the question: is there a reason this is still outstanding? Um, if so, what is it? If not, please pay us, please pay us now. It's overdue. Okay, so we'll keep a, a polite tone at this point. Um, you probably noticed my handwriting is not the best on the screen. So I am actually just going to pop up the answer here to show you the kind of thing you can write. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly like this, um, but it needs to be professional. It needs to be precise. It needs to include the information you've been given in the question. I would say the tone needs to be, um, you know, not too aggressive at this point it's only an initial letter it's not massively late their whole account isn't overdue and it's not you know a huge amount of monies either and therefore you won't be threatening legal action for example at this point uh letters don't need to be hugely long so sometimes i feel like students with these written questions go overboard they write war and peace on these it doesn't need to be massively long think about in practice if you're writing the letter to someone you wouldn't write an essay about it you'd be quite to the point um so as we can see we are addressing it to mr green we've got the name and address we've got the date we were given all that information i am writing to request payment of the outstanding invoice on your account and as i said we've given the number we've been precise it was due for payment 10 days ago from the date of this letter i have enclosed a statement of account which shows the total balance outstanding of 820 pounds 400 of which is now overdue please check over our statement of account and inform us if, if there is a reason why payment has not been made if there's no reason, please pay the outstanding balance immediately. Yours sincerely. So as we discussed, we know who we're writing to, Mr. Green. So yours sincerely. And then we've got that enclosure um, of the statement of account. So hopefully you can see this shouldn't be too intimidating. You're going to be given the information. You're not going to have to be guessing at anything. Keep your style formal, polite, obviously pay attention to things like the sign off and the date in if the examiner is giving you some information in the question be using that information as well don't go overboard on how much you're writing you know write professionally and succinctly so i hope that that was um a um you know, uh, a valuable run through. Let me just put my camera back on now that I'm not leaning right into the screen. So yeah, so I hope that was valuable. I hope you've learned something. Um, are there any questions to guys on the chat? Wonderful. Well, I know um, some of you were late, so don't, uh, if you want to catch the uh, recording from the beginning parts of the session, then that will be um, up on the website. Um, if you've got any questions, my, my email address is there again, so absolutely feel free to drop me an email and I can try and answer those questions, you know, either on anything from the session or the synoptic assessment in general. Um, so yes, so thank you very much for joining me um, and good luck with your exams. Thank <music> you.